Parshas Mitzorah. This week's parsha deals with how a Mitzorah, whether it's an individual or his clothing or his house that is afflicted by this nega, by this affliction, how to come out of it, how he gets purified and uh, is no longer in that state, has no longer has that status. So we mentioned last week that, according to Ramban and others, that uh, Tzara'as, in this case, is talking about a physical manifestation of a spiritual malady. And there's a problem spiritually, and it ends up on either our skin, on our clothing, on our homes. And it only happens in Eretz Yisrael, in the Ramban, and this week's Parsha says that that's because of the extreme sanctity of the land of Israel. So there's a delicate balance in the land of Israel that doesn't quite apply in Chutzaretz outside of Israel. And Israel is a spiritually sensitive land, and therefore these things will manifest in Israel. Now, uh, we know, or others have spoken about this, or Schwab speaks about it in this week's Parsha, that sometimes the Tanakh talks about Tzara'as, and it's talking about a typical infectious disease. That's not the case here. And uh, we have a, a, a verse in this week's Parsha that describes what happens when Tzara'as affects the walls of a house. It's in Perak Yudalad, Pasuk Lamed Dalad. That's 1434. The verse reads as follows, Ki el When you come to the land of Canaan, which I am giving to you, as a possession or as an inheritance. And I put a plague of tzaraas on a house that's in the land of your possession. So Rashi comments and he says, this is a besura tova. Well, he says besora. It's a besora. It's an announcement. People take it to be a positive announcement. He says, according to one reading, this is actually a besura by Yochai, um, who says that there, that one way this is positive is because the Emoriim who were in the land um, uh, who anticipated the Israelite invasion, took their uh, valuables and put them in the walls of the homes. And there's no way to tell if, uh, uh, under normal circumstances, what's behind the walls, uh, an opaque surface. But if it has tzaras and you knock down the walls of the, the house, you might find treasure. Another viewpoint on this is that tzaras gives, this is cited in Chazal, tzaras gives us an opportunity to do tshuva. Now, the, the Tosefta of Negoim, this is in Perak Vav Halacha Aleph, says... An afflicted house never was and never will be. So then the question is, well, why is the Torah writing uh, detail about something that never will be? So why is it written? Rather, examine it, extract messages from it, and receive reward. Now, it could be you get reward because you're creative and you're learning of Torah. It also could be reward because the messages that you learn are themselves a reward. So what's the message here? So according to some Mephorshim, the message is that um, not talking about hidden treasure. It's talking about stuff happened, bad stuff happened. Um, something that would warrant uh, a play coming on your house. That's not a good thing. But it's a good thing if it only afflicts, afflicts your house and it doesn't afflict you. It doesn't come close to you. That's a good thing. It's kind of like an early warning signal. And uh, Chazal are very sensitive to this. And they say, you know what? What's the warning? You have an opportunity to clean up your act. You have an opportunity to do tshuva. We see the chesed, the kindness of the Almighty, and that he gets around us but doesn't get us on occasion. And that uh, reminds me of an observation of Rabbi Yosher Ber Salavechik, who said, why is it that at Chatzos, at midday on Tisha B'av, which is a day dedicated to the morning of the temple, at Chatzos we get up, we're no longer sitting as mourners do on the floor or near the floor, but rather we sit on normal uh, chairs. And he says... That that's because by Chatzos, on, on the original Tisha B'av, by midday on the original Tisha B'av, it became clear that the Almighty was not going to take out his wrath for Israel's wrongdoing on the physical bodies of the individual Israelites of the Jews, but rather on Eitzim Vavonim, on um, wood and stone, if you will, what we would call today bricks and mortar, which was the Beis HaMikdash. So it was terrible that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. We, in fact, mourn the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash every year. Some people, every day. But there is a Nechama, there is some aspect of consolation in that we were not destroyed, but rather only physical structures were destroyed. Now, we have a strong Mesora of that kind of thinking, and that is at the Pesach Seder. The Pesach Seder, we have the song Dayenu. Ilu hotzi hotzi anu hotzi anu me mitzrayim. Had a Kodesh Baruch Hu taken us out of Egypt and not exacted justice against our enemies, Dayenu. Okay, I hear that. How about this one? Dayenu means enough. We're going to talk about what enough is. How about Elo Nasan Lano es Mamonam? 
Had he given us their money, but he didn't split the sea for us. That would have been sufficient. Sufficient for what? Had he not split the sea, what would have happened to us? Well, we don't know because we weren't there, but it did not sound good. It sounded like, from what the Torah wrote, that the only way out was through the sea in the dry land. Oh, that's the next one. Had he split for us the sea, but he had not taken us through the dry part of the sea to freedom. It would have been enough. Or had he taken us through, but not uh, uh, sunk our enemies in the in the sea? How about Il Kervanu of Ne'er Sinai, Velo Nasan Lano Esa Torah? Had he brought us to Mount Sinai, he didn't give us the Torah. Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu to, to come to Mount Sinai and not get the Torah. What does Dayenu mean? Dayenu means that one element is sufficient to give praise. Story's not over. Guess what? Story's never over. It's never over for the world and it's never over for an individual until the day he passes from this world. So everything, there are ups, there are downs, there are ups, there are downs. On the ups, we give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When Iran launches more than 300 missiles, drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and no one gets hurt. One Arab girl in a village gets hurt. It's not a good thing. And she's recovering. And other than that, no one gets hurt. Some physical damage. That presents two things to us. If we are if we're looking at this Abayas Hamanuga, the afflicted house, and we're taking we're extracting a lesson, two lessons from this. Number one, early warning system, opportunity to do tshuva, opportunity to correct our errant ways and to get closer to the Almighty. And we bring the Gula that way, or at least we have the capacity to bring the Gula that way. The ultimate redemption, Chazal say, comes about Ein Yisrael Nigolin Ela B'tshuva. That Israel will be redeemed only when they do tshuva. We're beginning to see how that could come about. There's so many people around the world who are taking upon themselves extra learning, extra mitzvahs. People who never put on tzitzis before are putting on tzitzis. People who never kept Shabbat before are keeping Shabbat. People who never put on tefillin are putting on tefillin. The, 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 the amount of extra learning and extra davening, it's remarkable. How far it's going, how long will it last, who knows. But we do know that there's an his, uh, there is a historical hisorus for tshuva. There is a general in, uh, encouragement to do tshuva, a general uh, sensitivity to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to assert our Jewish identity, not just cultural, but religious as well. So that's the early warning system. But also, how do we respond? How do you respond when Israel's mortal enemy sends hundreds of uh, projectiles, any one of which could have caused significant death and destruction, and very little of that happened? What's our response? Besides tshuva, it's got to be thanks. Because what does dayenu mean? Dayenu doesn't mean it would have been enough. End of story. Of course it wouldn't have been enough for us as Jews to have been at Mount Sinai and not received the Torah. That would have been enough. As Jews, as wanting the full portion that we should have in order to be proper servants of the Almighty. But it is enough to say hallel. It is enough to give thanks to the Almighty. And if there ever was a time to give thanks to the Almighty, it's now. Imagine. The, the historical, uh, uh, historically amazing phenomenon of all of these rockets coming. I mean, we thought we had it good in the, uh, the war with Iraq when Saddam Hussein sent 39 Scud missiles and uh, one person, only one person, died of a heart attack. That's a Rahman al That's a sad thing. But there are millions who were saved. And we have the same thing now. Only, not 39, 330 approximately drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. And we escaped Death. We have to give an endless amount of praise to the Almighty that we were spared a very, very tragic result from the attack of Iran. We will see the Gula soon. Chazal say, Benisan, Nigalu, Benisan, Asidim, Ligoyo. We were redeemed in Nisan. We are destined to be redeemed in Nisan. And we have to do our part. Our part is to do tshuva. And our part is to say thank you, full-throated, with song, to the Almighty. Yes, on bringing us out of Egypt. And yes, on sparing us from severe damage in the recent attack from Iran. Baruch Hashem. We are here. Baruch Hashem. Am Yisrael Chai. Baruch Hashem. Have a good Shabbos and a good Yom Tov.